I began investigating or trying to investigate medical marijuana back in 1992. I'd say that really for the last uh, 15 years or over the last 15 years, we have made uh, significant progress in trying to investigate both the safety of smoked marijuana uh, and its potential medical benefits. I started uh, in 1992 in the days when uh, I was focusing my career on AIDS and taking care of people with AIDS. And in 1992, before we had any effective antiviral drugs for HIV, many patients died of what was called the wasting syndrome, where they lost appetite, lost weight, and basically wasted away looking like concentration camp victims. In 1992, many of these people found that smoking marijuana was useful in that it increased their appetite and allowed them to gain some weight. In that same year, dronabinol, Marinol, synthetic Delta-9 THC became available for patients with the AIDS wasting syndrome. In a placebo-controlled trial, it had been demonstrated that patients getting the real Marinol increased their appetite, although their weight did not increase compared to the patients receiving placebo. But because there was concern, I believe, that there might be a run on the government's compassionate use program for marijuana, the government approved Marinol or Dronabinol for use in patients with the AIDS wasting syndrome. We at San Francisco General Hospital worked with a woman who is a volunteer here named Mary Rathbun. Mary uh, lost her only daughter to a drunk driver, but she herself was very much pro-medical marijuana. And she used to come to our clinic and wheel patients over to get x-rays, drop off their prescriptions in the pharmacy and take their blood to the lab. But she would also make brownies for her kids, as she called them. In 1992, I was at the International AIDS Conference, which was held in Amsterdam, of all places, and I glanced over at CNN in my hotel room, and I saw Mary Rathbun, Brownie Mary, being arrested for making brownies for our patients. And when I got back to San Francisco, there was a letter waiting addressed to the director of research in the AIDS program, which I'm not, but the letter found its way to me, suggesting that a clinical trial showing the medicinal benefits of medical marijuana should come from Brownie Mary's institution, as if she were our dean. But at that point in time, there was really not much else to study with regards to AIDS drugs. We only had three of them around, and they had already been studied in all sorts of permutations and combinations. So I picked up the gauntlet and began to communicate with Rick Doblin, who was the president of MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, who had sent this letter in the first place. And we worked together to tr try to develop a clinical trial uh, to look at the impact of smoked marijuana in patients with the wasting syndrome. And to make a long story short, we tried twice to get NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, to provide us with marijuana and funding to do a study in patients with the wasting syndrome and they refused. Basically, they thought our study was not scientific and they were concerned about the safety or the toxicity of smoked marijuana. In 1996, something happened, a few things happened. First of all, the people of California voted for the Compassionate Use Act, which allowed for physicians to talk to patients about the potential use of marijuana for medicinal benefit. Also in 1996, uh, we made it an advance in AIDS treatment by having availability now of potent antiretroviral drugs of the protease inhibitor class. These drugs, though, were broken down by an enzyme system in the liver that also breaks down other pharmaceutical drugs and substances of, of abuse, if you will. For example, there was a report of somebody dying taking ecstasy in one of the protease inhibitors. So this gave us a new opportunity to investigate cannabis because the active ingredients in marijuana are also broken down by the same pathway in the liver that metabolizes the protease inhibitors. So we submitted to the government a proposal to look at the safety of smoked cannabis compared to dronabinol, the oral version, in patients taking protease inhibitors. And many things by 1997 had changed from five years before, 
to the point where now we actually were granted the funds and the marijuana to do that study. And that was really the first study that we completed. Uh, we enrolled patients from 1998 uh, to the year 2000. We evaluated 62 patients who were either smoking cannabis three times a day for 21 days, taking dronabinol or a dronabinol placebo. And the question was, is there an interaction between cannabis, either smoked or you know, dronabinol, uh, and the patient's protease inhibitors, such that there would be loss of control of the HIV virus? Another question was, is there an interaction between cannabis and the immune system that might also lead to loss of control of the HIV viral suppression? Because people have always been concerned that cannabis or marijuana may have some immune altering function as well. So we did this study, which I must say, if I say so myself, was very elegant. And at the end of the day, we found out that there was no change in the level of virus over 21 days of either smoking or taking oral uh, dronabinol compared to those who took an oral placebo. Uh, we saw also no clinically significant effect on the level of the AIDS drugs in the bloodstream. And if anything, we saw some potential benefit to the immune system in the group smoking the marijuana or taking the dronabinol compared to the placebo. So with that information, we felt we have evidence that in this vulnerable population of people with HIV on protease inhibitors, that the use of cannabis smoked or oral was safe. Now, what I learned when I was trying to do this study in the first place was that NIDA is the National Institute on Drug Abuse. <clears throat> they have a congressional mandate to supply marijuana for clinical studies that are looking at it as a substance of abuse and not as a therapeutic agent. As Alan Leshner told me, we are the National Institute on Drug Abuse, not for drug abuse. So there is no real way to get marijuana from NIDA, which is the only legal source of marijuana, to study it to see if it may be safe and effective. In 1999-2000, the state of California established the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. Senator John Vasconcellos, one of our state senators, appropriated $3 million a year for three years to create the center, which then would fund research investigators who had peer-reviewed projects investigating the potential medical benefit of smoked marijuana. And NIDA then agreed to make marijuana available to researchers who were approved and funded by the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. So that allowed us to get funding then to begin to study whether or not marijuana was in fact effective for certain conditions. The condition that we chose to investigate was the so-called HIV-related neuropathy, or painful nerves. Patients with HIV aren't the only groups of people that get neuropathy. Diabetics, people getting chemotherapy are also troubled by this painful nerves, particularly in the feet and hands. And most of the currently available medicines that we have, even opioid, narcotic analgesics, don't really work very well. People have looked at antidepressants, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, acupuncture. None of them really work too well. People have settled on using an anti-seizure medicine uh, as the treatment of choice for this condition. But we felt that there was evidence from animal models and from anecdotal experience that cannabis might be useful in this neuropathic pain condition. So what we did was first a pilot study where we took 16 people who had HIV neuropathy and we admitted them to our general clinical research center at San Francisco General Hospital and for a week they smoked NIDA marijuana three times a day. That was just to give us an idea as to whether or not there was a decrease in neuropathic pain, and if so, how much, so that we could then calculate the sample size for a follow-up placebo control trial. In addition to evaluating the effect on their neuropathic pain, though, we also created pain through an experimental pain model, where we heated the skin of the forearm to 40 degrees, and then on top of that, we applied capsaicin cream Capsaicin is the active ingredient in chili peppers that makes them hot. And when you do that, 
to a, a recti rectangle on the forearm, it creates an area around the forearm where there's unusual feeling that we can map out with a brush and a piece of foam. And so with the person looking in the other direction, before and after smoking marijuana, this area was mapped out around the heat and creamed uh, rectangle. And so that's a much more uh, less prone to bias measurement of whether or not there's an effect on pain. And what we found in the pilot study was that the responses of the participants, their neuropathic pain, correlated extremely well with the response to the experimental pain. So we then went on to do a placebo-controlled trial, because that is the gold standard of clinical research. If you're developing a drug, you do a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial where neither the investigator nor the participant knows if they're receiving the active or the placebo agent. So for placebo, we had cigarettes that came from NIDA that looked and smelled exactly like the active uh, marijuana cigarettes, but the active ingredients had been extracted. We calculated that we needed about 50 patients uh, to do this comparison, and we enrolled 50 patients over the course of a year and a half to two years, and we reported uh, the results in the recently published paper in the journal Neurology. What we found was that the group smoking uh, the real cannabis had a statistically significantly better response in their pain and in their experimental pain to the group that smoked the placebo cannabis. And, you know, we're excited to have been able to demonstrate uh, this effectiveness of marijuana in this condition. We've subsequently completed another study where we took healthy subjects who were young 25 to 40 year old marijuana smokers and we again in our general clinical research center had them smoke or vaporize NIDA cigarettes of three different strengths. So on any one of six days they either smoked or vaporized half of a cigarette of low, medium, or high potency. And in that study we demonstrated that the amount of THC arriving in the bloodstream was very similar if they smoked it or if it was vaporized. Now the beauty of vaporization is that people aren't smoking. It's not a burnt product, it's a vapor. And there's also no expired carbon monoxide, which is a marker for toxic gases, noxious gases. We also found that the high was similar in the two groups and out of the 18 participants, 14 of the 18 actually preferred the vaporization. So the study that we're now doing, that vaporizer study was also funded by the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research, but now we're doing another study funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And that's a study in cancer patients who have pain and are taking morphine or Oxycontin. And we believe that there is enough evidence, again, from animal models and from anecdote that the combination of cannabinoids and opioids not only is additive in relief of pain but more than additive or if you will synergistic so we're hoping that we can demonstrate this by measuring blood levels of the morphine or the oxycontin before and after vaporizing cannabis in our general clinical research center and if that turns out to be the case then the goal would be that patients with cancer or with whatever other condition requires these opioids will be able to take less of a dose for a longer period of time with fewer side effects. Because the main side effects of the opioids are nausea, vomiting, and constipation. And marijuana probably has benefit in those realms as well. So that is sort of the, the scope of the clinical research that we've been doing here at San Francisco General investigating uh, cannabis safety uh, and its therapeutic benefits. Are you guys allowed at all? I, I'm assuming you're only allowed to use the cannabis supplied by, yeah, by NIDA. NIDA. NIDA is the only legal source of cannabis for research in this country. Every time I give a lecture someplace, people come up and say, hey, I've got better marijuana than you can get from NIDA, but it doesn't work that way. That's the only legal source of cannabis. 
So, in your opinion, do you feel that there probably is a more a higher potency? And it's not an opinion. I mean, it's a known fact that there's a higher potency. But does that mean that this cannabis doesn't work? It's hard for me to say that when I've done a trial that's been published that shows that it works better than placebo. Yeah. 